we get deployed to Vietnam with his age 46, and that's a tandem. Looks like a Chinook, but it's a baby Chinook. It's, it's two thirds the size. And so we shoot on over to Nam, and uh, I'm a door gunner on aircraft, the commanding officer's aircraft, Echo Tango 50. I'm the door gunner, and even though I'm avionics, I'm the door gunner. Uh, because not everybody in the squadron wanted to fly in a combat zone because they were shooting at us, literally. <laughs> and so I uh, was flying. So um, what transpired was um, we, uh, we had a mission one day in the uh, south. We were landed at a place called Kiha, which is just south of Chulai, which is about on the... Uh, Probably, uh, I don't know, 60 miles south of Da Nang. And so we were working there, and uh, we were working south of there in the, um, and up in the mountains. And we were taking a Marine recon team of, um, a heavy recon team of uh, six Marines in our aircraft and five and the one behind us. And we were going out in Indian country, pretty far out there. So we go out there, and um, the pilots, the executive officer, a guy named um, uh, Major Greg Corliss, who retired out a major general. Uh, Greg Corliss was the pilot. co-pilot was a guy by the name of Captain Wayne Julian, retired lieutenant colonel, was in Texas. Um. So we go out, and uh, in the briefing, we're we're going to put him on this side of this hill. And he said, you got to be careful because there's booby-trapped 500-pound bomb booby-trapped on this. And we don't want to set one of them off because that'd be the end. So we're going to go in there. So how we're going to do is go in there. I'm gonna, the first plane's going to set down, put the ramp down, and we're going to count to 15, no, nothing fired, then they're going to, they'll run out rather than just land and run out because we knew this was going to be a problem. We had no gun support, just the two aircraft. Went in there and landed. And before we could put the ramp down, there was a machine gun nest and I was on the left side of the aircraft, and on the uh, probably when we look and do in the front of the aircraft, twelve o'clock at the two o'clock position, and he raked through the aircraft. Everybody was shot in the aircraft but me. Um, the Greg Corliss was shot in the arm, and uh, Wayne Julian was shot to both legs. The crew chief was shot. Um, first in the leg, and then when he fell, the way he rolled, they, he got shot in the back. And then the six recon men were all shot, and one was shot between the eyes. A big red-headed Marine, big guy. He had red hair and wore Buddy Holly glasses on him, and he was a machine gunner. He was shot. I was the only one that wasn't. It happened like this, but it's slow motion. And I turned around, because I was facing, I turned around and looked, and one of the bullets had gone through the number one engine fuel line, which is about that big around, and it had went straight through, and it was spraying fuel from the back of the aircraft to the front. So I re Ram back, unfortunately, stepped on body, stepped on these guys' engine, just stepped on there and grabbed this line and held it. And then we all had scarves. I took my scarf off and John Wayne and tied it like that and then pulled this machine gunner back. He was on the end of the ramp and pulled him back and waited for us to get out of the LZ. We could not get out of the LZ without the enough fuel going in the engine. And apparently me covering this fuel line gave enough fuel that Major Corliss was able to pull us 
out. We were on the side of a hill, and all he did was pull us out, and we drove to the ground, to the valley, and got enough fair speed to get flying. One of the things that happened was all the communications in the whole aircraft was severed. I don't know. I, I, I can't remember exactly how, but lines were severed. So there was no communication within the aircraft called ICS and no communications with the outside. So our wingman comes and sees us bailing out, so he comes and lets his team off. Now, be, I don't remember this, but the, I've read enough about it. Apparently, between the time we were shot up and the time I went back to hold the fuel line, I went over to um, Dave Langlois's, he was Scrooge's, his gun, 50 cal, and so who was shooting at us, and I unloaded 50, there were 50 rounds, I unloaded it. And apparently, I nullified, according to Wayne Julian, I've talked to him, he said, you nullified, you're shooting, null stopped what was going on. But I don't remember that. Anyway, so we're flying back, and I pull this guy back, and I look, and his pack is smoking, smoke. And we're I'm in fuel up to probably up past my ankles. It was spraying in the aircraft. So I, you know, you have your, your Marine, take out your K-bar, <laughs> and I cut the pack off, and I threw it out. And it went out the back ramp, and we were about a thousand, no, not even that, probably six hundred feet off the ground. And before it hit the ground, it exploded. Our wingman's behind us, and he sees this, and he thought we were taking air burst. So he's calling, you know, all you know, they're taking air burst. Anyway, we couldn't maintain altitude. So we went up the valley to the end of this valley, which was probably five, seven miles. And we landed at a little Arvin outpost that had two or three 105 uh, artillery pieces in it and literally landed hard. And as soon as we landed, I put the ramp down to get the fuel out. And then I started dragging out the wounded. And I went up to the, finally walked up to the front. Julian, Captain Julian couldn't get out because he was shot in the legs, both legs. So I had to go outside, open the door, pull him out that way. And then Major Corliss came out and he said, uh, you know, start taking triage. We were in a, there were no Americans at this little place we were at and so um and he they had a medic on board so he was working so our wingman lands what happened <laughs> so greg corliss he's the xo he tells the wingman tells the co-pilot of the wingman to get out of the plane he's we got to go back and get the other team members so i said i'll go too because i know where they are and he said no you stay here so just before they lifted off, you know, don't tell me no. I hop in the plane, and I and off we go. So there's a door, the 50 cows here, and there's a door here that's from the plane. And so I'm standing in the door, and um, we're rolling in, and to pick up, to pick up the um, the crew members, the the rest of the recon team. And uh, their team call sign recon team was basketball. And I've tried to find guys on the team over the years. I have tried to find. Anyway, so we land. Now we're firing up, shooting like crazy. The guys on the ground don't know why, because everybody, the NBA were dead. There were four dead in the machine gun nest, which I found out later. But anyway, we pulled. We pull them out, we bring them back, and um, so we land, and because uh, we got to pick up the uh, co-pilot um, that we left, 
and I tell uh, Major Corliss, I'll stay with the aircraft, and we, or the Vietnamese will steal everything out of it, and I'll get it ready because it can't fly out. We're going to have to sling load it, bring in a big helicopter to pick it up and take it home because it had uh, f- uh, 51 hits in it, 51 bullet holes in it, and uh, it was... There was a lot of damage. So I said, I'll spend, you know, don't worry, go on up. I'll just stay here with it. Well, I spent the night with it, which was sort of spooky because not only the NBA, but there's the Ardman all around me, and I'm the only American. And, you know, John Wayne, you can talk all you want about John Wayne. That wasn't my day of being John Wayne. So the next morning, we pick up the aircraft, and I've got it all ready except taking the blades off. I didn't take the blades off. I can't. It takes four people to take the blades off. But I got it all ready to go to get out. So we swing it back to Kiha. We get back to Kiha and we land. Um, and so um, then I go, once I get out of the aircraft, and the aircraft lands, I go over to the aircraft. And I'm, I'll never forget this. I was just sitting on the ramp, sitting on the ramp. And it was finally hitting me. We're all now, you know, everybody comes out and they're counting the bullet holes. And I'm thinking, oh, gee, you know. And um, Dave Langlois was a good friend of mine. I mean, the crew chief, he, he was, we're squadron mates. He's good. And Dave, and um, the best man at my first wedding was a kid named Jimmy Axton. And he was there and he came, he put his arm around me. Next thing I know, the sergeant major comes up and says, hey, you know, um, Sergeant White, you know, um, Bill Shad, the Colonel, Bill Shadrick wants to see him. I said, okay, so I go on. So just before I get in, um, a guy, Master, Master Gunner Sergeant um, uh, E.R. Smith grabs me and he says, don't say a word, do not say a word. We got you covered. I don't know what the hell he's talking about. So I walk in, report, and there's the main, uh, avionics chief right there. Um, and I'm not going to mention his name, but he's deceased now. And um, uh, he and I didn't like each other. Let's just say that. Anyway, so... Um, I go in and report, and he said, uh, Sergeant White, you're here um, uh, for an Article 15, which is a, um, you know, and I, I'm looking at this, and yes, sir, uh, what's the charges? And he said, uh, direct disobedience of a lawfully given order in a combat zone. Now, I'm not a jailhouse warrior, but I'm pretty smart, and I'm thinking, hmm. This is in a combat zone, this up the ante. So uh, he says, um, what do you want to do? And I said, ah, I want to I want a general court martial. I, you know, I'm not going to take the, on Article 15, Mitch, you guilt. I'm going to. So I said, what are the charges? And he said, the charges are that you did, on my helmet, you did not take, I had big yellow letters. F U communism. And he said, Ma- the master gunnery sergeant, avionics chief, told gave you a direct order multiple times to take it off. And then so I said, Well, sir, he said, You got anything to say? And now this is the day after I've been shot to crap. So I looked and I said, You know what? Um if he had done his job in World War II in Korea, I wouldn't be here right now. Which my CO, my CO, Bill Shadrick, had been in Guadalcanal. He'd also been at Korea. He was 27 year Marine, full burn. And I'm telling him, this guy <laughs> didn't do his job. And he looked at me and he said, hmm. he said, well, um, before you sign the papers for a general court martial, here's what I recommend. And I had with me Master Gunnery Sergeant 
a mecha- um, assistant maintenance chief. Uh, E.R. Smith was in Northern California now, old guy, got to be in his 90s. And he, he said, uh, Master, uh, Master Sergeant Smith recommends that um, you tone down your helmet. I'm going to transfer you out of the avionics shop, and you're going to be my crew chief, and I want my airplane back up. You, I said, I'll plead guilty to that. <laughs> and um, so I walk out, and I'm no longer in avionics. I have my own airplane. Unfortunately, Dave Lang- Langlois never came back to the unit. He was shot up that bad. But I ended up the commanding officer's crew chief. I've never been through A school or B school as a mechanic. mechanic. And I was a, a, a twidget, they call it electronics guy, but I crewed. Subsequently, that two guys that I knew did the same thing I did. They cross-chained in Vietnam to become mechanics and flew. And one of them's a very, very, very good friend of mine, uh, Red Logan. He became a, a, a mech, too. But anyway, so... Um, I flew my ass off, and uh, that includes case on and all that. And um, just before, um, uh, probably in the spring of '66, I went out on R and R, and Jim Axton, Jimmy Axton, my best, best man at my wedding, Jimmy and I, he he was an avionics, and he was corporal. Whenever he could fly, he flew with me. So he said, we were uh, we were on flight scans, and we both got uh, R and R's to Hong Kong. And I said, "Let's go. Let's. They are going to Hong Kong and raise hell, you know." So we go there, and we um, it's a side note. We go to Hong Kong, and uh, Jimmy and I, and um, we come back, and my plane at the time was in a hundred hour overhaul, so it wasn't ready to go back up the case on. So uh, it was going to be like a day or two. And so Jimmy said, I'll, I'll go up to Quezon, and when, we get, when you get up there, we'll swap. You will be your gunner again, we'll swap. Fine. So he took off. And uh, later that day, I was working on the plane, and uh, Sergeant Major Ralph B. Holmes came out to me with John Ackerley, John John. John John had a real high voice, weighed 230 pounds, and was a Marine heavyweight boxer. And he and I, on, and a few of us, and we had got into it. And yeah, we were great. Loved the guy, John John. He's passed away now. Anyway, <clears throat> John John and the Sergeant Major came down and come here. He said, We lost a plane, and Jimmy Axton was killed. And uh, broke me up. Uh, so anyway, the reason I bring this up was years later, I uh, was uh, in the Bay Area, and I um, a uh, a news crew was doing a thing about Vietnam veterans, and they talked to me, and they said, and basically it's a quickie, and they said, what's the best time, or what's the worst time, Vietnam? And the worst time was losing Jimmy Axon. So I talked about it, and then I thought, you know, that was stupid. Jimmy's folks live here. He's from Oakland. So I think I'll call him and tell him, look, I don't want you to watch TV, and this guy comes on and t- start talking about your son that was killed. So um, I uh, called information, <coughs> and there was two accidents living in Oakland. One at 123 Nice Street. And one at one eight nine four seven six one hundred sixteenth way or place or something. And I said, "Well, I'm going to Oakland is a racially divided city." So I said, "Well, I've got all what I'm going to say on a three by five card because I know it's going to be emotional, and I'm an emotional guy." So I said, "I'm going to try them." 
other one first because I'm sure it just one, two, three nice is where they live. So I dial the phone and I pick a, a little girl answers the phone. I hear kids playing and this little girl's voice said hello. And I said, yeah, I said, my name's uh, Jim White. And I'm looking for the family of uh, Jimmy Axton. He was with me in Vietnam. And the little girl's voice said, that was my son. And mom killed me. Anyway, I had a great talk with her. Told her what I what I I had talked about. I said I want you to watch TV and or have a neighbor say somebody's talking about Jimmy on, who you know, she she was real nice. And at the end of the conversation, she says, "If there's anything I can do for you, here's a woman that lost her only son, her only son. Is there anything I can do for you? Let me know." And I mean, well. Of course, my three by five cars, they, they were worthless. So when in the talk, I said, you don't really know who I am. And she said, yes, I do. And I said, no, I don't think so. She said, yeah, I have your picture on the mantle. And I thought, what? You have my picture on the mantle? And she said, when Jimmy's effects came home in his camera, the last picture was when you and him were together at the airport at Hong Kong, ready to come back to the to Nam. So that picture was taken basically a day, two days before he was killed. And I'm going to tell you, I mean, I'm all haunted by that. I've had losses, but that one haunts me, Jimmy. He's just his smiling face. California kid, pure one hundred percent California boy, had a, a black uh, uh, GTO um, sixty five uh, GTO chrome rims. I mean, yeah. Anyway, so uh, go back. I um, I get caught. We're out on the ship. We deploy out. You rotate on the ship with the battalion of Marines, and we're going up to the DMZ. And um, so we're on the ship, and uh, the uh, we're having an awards and decoration ceremony. And I'm not into that. I had a big old handlebar mustache. Uh, I uh, always had a little bit too long hair, and I don't do crap for medals. I don't. I don't. That's not me. I just don't like it, and, and, and I hate it. So we're on ship. Well, I'm a captive audience on ship. So, so we got an A&D ceremony, so the squadron fills out, and we're on this deck, and it's going. It's a, a, we got our aircraft shoved in the back, and, and uh, so they wind us up, and all of a sudden they wind me up, and I'm right next to uh, um, the colonel. And the major, and then me, and then a captain, and a, or major, and a captain. What the hell's going on here? Why am I here? You know, so I, I told the sergeant major, hey, you made a mistake. I'm in the back row. <laughs> anyway, he said, no, you just stand there. So the guy that's presenting the medals is a guy named Victor Kulak, three star general, a legend, a legend. And, in the Marine Corps. And at the time, he was a senior Marine of the Western Pacific. He was based out of Hawaii. He was about five foot four. His son ended up the commandant of the Marine Corps. His kid ended up a four star. But he was um, about five four. And in the Marine Corps, you never, when you report, you never look at a, uh, somebody in the eyes. You look through them or over their head, and you stare, you know, you know. So I got the top of this hat. So he gets in front of me, and he says, uh, uh, gives me this medal. And the medal was, I'd, I'd already want some medals from the Marine Corps, but this is a big one because it was a distinguished flying cross, and my claim to fame was I was the first enlisted Marine 
to uh, receive a distinguished flying cross since um, Vietnam, uh, since World War II. It was a huge deal, huge deal. They had cameras and all this. Anyway, so I'm standing there, and he says, he gives it to me, and I'm looking at my sergeant major. I keep looking because you can't look down at this general. And what? And he asked me, uh, Sergeant Way, what do you want to do in the Marine Corps? And so I, was, I said, Sir, I want to be a flying peon. Now, the flying peons were World War II guys that were sergeants that never got commissions that were pilots. And we had one. Our Sergeant Major's command pilot flew in World War II as a flying sergeant, Korea flying sergeant. Couldn't fly fixed wings anymore. They put him in helicopters. These guys were a little, and I didn't know it at the time. I knew there were very few, but at the time we were down to less than 20 in the whole Marine Corps. Anyway, I said, uh, Sir, I want to be a flying peon. And uh, he said, You flying peon? What, you know, he said, What? What makes you think you could do that? And I said, well, I have a commercial fixed wing license. I had worked my time. I'd gotten my 160 hours. I have a commercial fixed wing license. He said, you have four years of college. I said, no, sir. He said, well, you can go to NAVCAT. Are you married? And I said, yes, sir. Can't go to NAVCAT. So he said, and we're not making, and my sergeant major standing right next to him. He goes, we're not making any of these son of a bitches anymore. We're trying to get rid of them. <laughs> now, my belief, I don't know if this is fact, but my belief is that Kulak and my sergeant major knew each other. They had to back in the old corps because the old corps wasn't that big. When World War II broke out, there was only 1,200 officers in the whole Marine Corps. There was only 17,000 enlisted men. So if you're in aviation, you even reduce that by at least 90%. Everybody knew everybody. So he said, we're not making any more of these sons of bitches. I'll never forget that. These sons of bitches, and we're trying to get rid of them now. And Sergeant Major, I'm looking at Sergeant Major, and he's, you know. Anyway, so he says, here's what I'll do. I can transfer you to the Army. And they'll take you as a warrant. So my thought was, oh, I'll take this, go do minimum time in the Army, come back in the Marines, transfer back, I'll be a Marine pilot. And we said, yes, sir. So basically I forgot about him. And we're in a case on, there's a siege going on, early, uh, this uh, Fe January, February, well, March, April, um, the siege. And... Um, it was bad. It was it was horrible. Um, every air we had twenty four aircraft, and in the first thirty days, we lost twenty eight. We went through aircraft that quick. Now you got to figure there's. We moved from four man crews to five, meaning you had two door gunners and a crew chief, and you were okay. So. We had one aircraft we in our squadron where we lost 22 men, meaning we were taking guys out to Quezon to work on damaged aircraft, and they were shot down and gone. So Quezon was an SOB. It was tough. Um, you land there, um, you land there, and... Um, to pick up wounded at the Strip. And they had to run to put them in there because we'd take incoming. Or they, they watched us. So when the helicopter's coming in, our CO <clears throat> at the time was a guy named um, Dave, uh, Dave Holthoff, A-L-T-H-O-F-F, from uh, Phoenix, Arizona area. Um, he became the Marine Aviator of the Year. He received three silver stars in less than three weeks. He's the guy that figured out, or he made he made a thing called the gaggle on how used to be we'd go into an area to resupply Hill 881, 861 North South. We'd go in one plane, we'd go in, land, and they had the 
thing zeroed in, land, throw out the ammo, the water, and replacements, and pick up the medevacs and peel out. And you were going to get shot up pretty bad up in there. In fact, we, like I say, we lost, we lost twenty-eight aircraft in, um, um, uh, in, in, in our first month flying there. We it was horrible. We only had twenty-four. They were replacing, bringing aircraft up from other squadrons. We didn't have time to mark them markings off. We'd get them in the morning, and they'd be flying that afternoon out there. So it was tough. And for a crew, uh, for a group of guys, 256, 260 guys, we, we put in long hours, especially at night with a red flashlight fixing them. But uh, great guy, unbelievable. Um, so if you were going to go to Quezon, you were going with HMM 262, the Flying Tigers. You were going there and uh, with us. And if you were coming out, you were coming out with us, whether in a body bag or, or a medevac, you were coming out with us. Anyway, um, <clears throat> it was so bad um, that you just didn't have time to think. And we were running on a journey when you couldn't. The, at night, we everybody was underground, underground bunkers, and the rats, the rats didn't eat us. They ate what we threw there, but you'd be sleeping, and, and I'm telling you, these rats were this big, they'd come up on you. you get the hell away from me like that. I mean, it, 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 the conditions, and I'm a sort of history buff, made me think of um, World War I, the trenches. It was horrible. And um, they had the high land. And they were, we were taking direct rocket fire uh, and uh, um, artillery fire from North Vietnam. That's how close we were. It was direct. So when the planes would come in, they even got a C-130 coming in, landing. They hit him with a motor and boom, killed half the crew in the C-130. Got so bad, C-130s couldn't come in and deliver cargo. So what they did was come in low level, pop out a parachute and slide across the... It was, yeah. The grunts on the ground, I... I the guy tells me he's a case on vet. He's got total respect because I've been there. So anyway, in uh, late February, uh, I'm flying and I say, hey, White, Dave Altoff, I'm his crew chief, he says, hey, uh, grab your stuff. You've got to go back to uh, to Kwong Tree, our restaurant place. I said, why? And he said, you just go on back there. He said, you got to go back to see Sergeant Major. So my mom had been fighting on and off cancer, and I'm thinking, uh, this is emergency leave. I can see this. So I go back there, and uh, Sergeant Major says, no. He says, you're going to Okinawa for discharge. You're going, when you're going to be out, you're going in the Army. And I said, Wow. General Kulak followed through his his aide taking all the notes and followed through. So I get up to Okinawa, I get discharged, go over to Butner, get uh, sworn in, and there's five of us. There's myself, a Marine staff sergeant, um two squids. Uh, Navy guys, Air Force guy, we all have uh, commercial f licenses. So he said, you guys will all go back to the States. So they, he said, uh, when they're we're processing, they, you know, all the guys say, well, can I get leave? Can I get leave? Well, when they come to me, they say, how, uh, you know, you, how, how much leave you want? I, I don't want any leave. Just send me back. Get me. Let's get this done. I want to get back over here. And so um, we, um, I got orders back to um, to uh, to um, 
I forgot the base, Fort Polk, Louisiana. And from there, I'd go right into the flight school thing, uh, helicopter school uh, program. Well, <clears throat> I get there, and I'm I'm the square peg in the round hole. You didn't go through the North. You haven't been through boot camp. Marines don't go through other people's boot camp. You people go through Marines camp, but we don't go through. Well, um, we're going to have to figure out what the hell to do with you. So while you're waiting, um, here's what we want you to do. You come in and check in um, every morning. Just come by and see the first shirt. You know, I said, well, my grandmother lives up here in East Texas, which is about uh, two hours, two and a half hours away. Can I go see her? Okay, call in. So I did that for about a week. I, and I go uh, back to the base. Sergeant, uh, first sergeant says, hey, I don't know what the hell we're going to do with you. And you are screwed up the whole program. Maybe a month before we can get you into the mix. So he says, um, I, I said, so what the hell do I do? And he said, well, you know, what do you want to do? He said, there's nothing here. I can't. You, I said, he is a master blaster, master jumper. I said, can you, can you weasel away where I can go to jump school and come right back? And he said, you serious? I said, yeah. So he said, yeah, I can. Let me make some phone call. So he sends me to jump school. I go to jump school, and I know I'm going right back and go to flight school. Finish jump school, and when I'm finished, I go to see the first shirt, and I said, you know, I'm, he says, I talked to the other first shirt in, in Louisiana, and you're, nothing's come down about you. And I said, oh, Jesus. I said, can, at that time, ranger school was three weeks. And it's right there. It's a week there, and you just walk around and try not to get lost in the, in the southern pines. There's no distinguishing marks, so everything's got to— you can get lost easy and directly. You can't. There, there's no mountain to look at, no, you know. So there's a week there, a week in Delega, Georgia, and a week in—, um, in uh, uh, Eglin Air Force Base area uh, swamps. Well, I don't have a problem with hot weather swamps. I'm not afraid of snakes at all. I collected them. That's not it. But I'm going to tell you, I'm afraid of heights. I know. You jump out of planes, you know, you, you fly. But I'm afraid of heights. Go, going up a ladder right here, I think about it. <laughs> I so anyway I said well I'll go to can you get me into ranger school and I think it was three bottles of bourbon I think is what it cost me to give him and I got to ranger school finish ranger school come back and he said um okay here's your orders and I looked at him and it said I said wait a minute these aren't to flight school he said these come down so I got assigned to an infantry unit as a grunt infantry sergeant, and uh, on a frag to Vietnam. So I go to Vietnam now. I'm infantry, and I go there, and I was I went to First Battalion, Sixth Infantry, the One Ninety Eighth. Um, um, so I go there, and I'm, <clears throat> I check, and I tell him, look, I'm not supposed to be here. I'm supposed to be in flight school. And that first sergeant said, yeah, sure. Next, go. You know, you're a sergeant. Go down. So I go, and I go out in the bush for a couple months, uh, almost three months. And lo and behold, first sergeant calls me. And, you know, you get on the helicopter. You got to go back. What do you want, top? He said, Hey, you were supposed to be in flight school. We got orders to send you back to the States for flight school. So I'm thinking, I just did three months and, you know, it's a grunt, which I respect those guys, but I've been a Marine. I've been a machine gunner. I didn't like playing 
machine gun right in where I was a sergeant then. I just didn't want me to be a grunt over there. So I go back, I go through flight school, I graduate flight school, and uh, I get sent back to Nam right, right away, which is okay. I, I have to say I enjoy it. So I get to Vietnam, get off, and everybody's in shell shock. I'm, I've already done 19 months in Vietnam. I did four months in Dom Rep, and then I had done three, just under a week under three months with the Army as a grunt in Vietnam. So we get off in, uh, in, uh, down by Saigon. We go to 95th Repo Depot, and they march you like cattle in there. And I finally get up. I'm a wobbly one. I got my wings, and I got my— uh, In fact, I used to— <laughs> I have multiple set of wings. I have my uh, I have my pilot wings, and I have my, of course, my jump wings, and I have CIB, which is all army. And I also have on top of that ring combat air crew wings, which are illegal to wear. There you're supposed to wear them there, but I they're combat wings. I wore them before I got the CIB. So um, I get up to the table, and the major looks at me, and he says, "You returnee?" And I said, "Yeah." He said, where would you like to go? Now, everybody else is going here. You're going there. And you're going, where would you like to go? And I said, I want to go as far north as you can send me up by the DMZ. I said, I know that area. I was a Marine in that area. I know that area. So he turned around and looked at the map, and he said, there's, there's a unit up in Dong, Dong Ha, which I know Dong Ha. I flew out of there. Dong Ha is about... Um, Two miles from North Vietnam, on, on, right on the uh, Ben Hai River, just down from Qua Viet. So I said, I'll take it. Oh, well, he said, okay. You know, why would you go there? <laughs> you know, because the story's about the DMZ, and that's the DMZ, and, um, and I Corps are different. Vietnam's basically three different landscapes. There's the DMZ, there's the Central Highlands, and then there's the Delta. And basically fighting there is three different styles of fighting. And if you talk to most people, they'll say, send me down south. You don't hear anybody say, oh, send me as far north as you want to go. You got it. Anyway, so I go up there and I check in. And um, so when I check in, this is amazing. I check in and they said, um, the colonel, he was promotable to general, meaning he's got the P's, waiting to become a general. Uh, we'll see you in a minute. And what are those wings? And what's that handlebar mustache? And what's that patch? Now, the Army wears combat patches, the Marine Corps doesn't. Once again, I cheated. For a combat patch, I could wear, I legally could wear the second Marine aircraft wing or the first Marine aircraft wing or the 198th Army. Okay? But I wore the first Marine Division patch because. The first wing patch and his, his second wing patch, they look like crap. And nobody know what they are, but they know what that first Marine Division patch is. And he looked at it, and he, this was the S-1. He was um, uh, he a major, I think. Maybe a lieutenant colonel, maybe a major. He looked at that, and he said, how old are you? Because it says Guadalcanal on it. And I said, I was up here with the 1st Marine Division before you knew where Vietnam was, which just ticked him off good. So, you know, I started off on the right foot there. So I go in to report, and I walk in, and the colonel was waiting for a star. is a black man. And I never heard of a black full colonel, never mind one who's going to be a general. So Roscoe Cartwright stands up. He's about 6'3", shaved head. 
and uh, we sh- welcome aboard. And this guy, no nonsense guy, and I uh, said, you know, you want to fly for me? And I said, yes, sir. Want to have me? He said, okay. Welcome aboard. So we were flying three different, at the time, two different kind of aircraft. We were flying OH-23Gs. Gs don't mean guns. This is the bubble aircraft that looks similar to what you see on MASH. This was a Korean War aircraft and a trainer. And we were flying these in combat. Now, if you lose an engine in one, you immediately look between your legs because that's where you're going to land. They land like a rock. And they're avgas. If you take a bullet, they're not, they're not um, jet fuel. Avgas has a, a much lower flash point. And uh, phew, they're gone. So we had uh, six of those, and we had six OH-6s, which look like an egg. And uh, so I went and checked out in a six. So I immediately got checked out in a six. And um, uh, we flew those, and we flew basically ash and trash for about maybe two months. And I went to the colonel, and I said, Colonel uh, Cartwright, um, we take a rocket fire every night. So let's try this. Let's run an early morning VR and a late evening VR. Now, we don't have, we can't count on anybody doing it for us. So let's equip two aircraft to do that. That may put a minigun on it, put a door guard. And so I, and he, I said, I'll, I'll run this operation. And he said, he went along with it. So we started doing the VRs, and um, uh, we I flew for him for seven months in the DMZ of Lion VRs. My platoon leader was a guy named Jim Mitski, Captain Jim Mitski. He was uh, a- ADA, Aerial Defense Artillery, ADA guy, from a um, little town called Harold, Texas, up by the Panhandle. His mom was the, um, get this right, I think his mother was the uh, postmistress and ran the county store. It's a one horse town. Boom. Anyway, Jimbo was the, um, he went to, uh, I think he went to uh, college in Oklahoma on a football scholarship. Anyway, great guy, wonderful guy, big Jimbo. So um, Jim extends. And says, I'm out of here. I'm going to extend and fly Cobras for um, ARA, Aerial Rocket Artillery, because um, the units, uh, there were three units. Charlie Battery was the Griffins. They were flying for Special Forces into Laos, North Vietnam, Long Range, MACV SOG. That's their mission. So Jim and I talked about it, and he extended. I extended three weeks later, went to the same unit, checked in. He's my platoon leader. So, and I'm going to see him this August, and I haven't seen him since 1970. And as I'm looking forward, I'm really looking forward to it. So, uh, just before I leave um, the unit to go to flying for the Griffins, just before I leave, we were doing a, we'd, we'd go out early in the morning, just very light, and go into the DMZ really right. And actually, we I'd cross the DMZ, go into North Vietnam, no more than a, a, a mile, no more, because that's Indian country. And, and if you get shot down there, your hands, you're really in a mess. So I went out there one morning. And um, and a high a high aircraft over me, and I uh, went out there, and we were looking for rockets and what have you. Coming back, I crossed a ridge line. Now this is rolling hills, so we're I'm low level. Loaches, I like flying very low. The propensity of getting nailed from a one shot Charlie 
is there, but nothing like if you're a thousand feet, uh, everybody can shoot at you. So my theory is go go low and as fast as hell. Relatively, in a scout position, you're doing 40 miles an hour, not fast. And we're good enough that I can actually trace a blood trail. We hit NBA, I can trace their tracks. And depending on the moisture, if we've had rain that, let's say, the day before, and there's no rain in that, in the footprints, I know those are very fresh. Or if it's in the morning, and there, we had a heavy dew that night before, there's nothing I can, I can tell you within reason now how old the foot tracks are. I'm not, and this is not me, this is, this is scout pilot talk now. We can, we're pretty good at scouts. So I'm coming back over Ridgeline, and there was a machine gun set up on the backside. When I came over, he got me from uh, the backside, raked my aircraft. And I took, um, I think, 31 hits, if I remember. I blew out my my windshield and my control, my um, um, my instruments going that way. I took three, three hits in the... Uh, armor seat, and my crew chief door gunner, um, a kid named uh, Langshan, was gut shot, fell out, but he was on a monkey cord, and he fell out. And to this day, I don't know why, but I even took a, a, a one round up by the compressor in the engine, I kept flying. Anyway, I flew it back to 18 surge, landed, and... Um, uh, the point, as soon as I landed, the fuel was coming out. I mean, it was dead. That was it. And so I said, you know, I, I'm just getting hairy up here now. <laughs> so um, the very next morning, I went back out, and um, I, I knew where the enemy was, that ridge line. So I went back there, and I was going to come around and get him from another way. And uh, so when we were, and Mike, I had a new crew chief, and I told him, look, this guy, he's on this ridgeline somewhere. He caught me from the back. So we're going to attack the ridgeline from perpendicular and run down the side of it. And you, as soon as you see it, you throw out the smoke, and, and he has a 60. And I said, rake it. And then what we'll do is we'll turn around, and then we'll come in where the smoke is, directly at him, and um, I'll use my minigun. So anyway, um, they got us pretty good. Neither of us were hit, but the aircraft was, all, every bells and whistles, it wasn't going to fly any further. So I got it about um, maybe a click, and maybe a click and a half away when I drove it into the ground. I mean, it just wouldn't fly anymore, and poof. So my wingman picked me up, picked me up, called in, said, hey, White's down, lost the aircraft, and I told, told him, get another aircraft ready. We're going back out. And so I had the same crew chief. We went back out with a different aircraft, and now we got um, we got uh, um, a couple of Cobras from the CAV came up to help us um, and so it went, we marked it, and I got blasted again, and this time I made it closer to the base before I drove it into the ground. Bad, like I say, bad day. Anyway, my wingman picked me up, high ship came and picked me up, I said, get another one ready, so we got, we went out a third time, and the Cobras were working the area, they did a great job, so then when they they made you know they said go ahead and go in there and check so I went in there to check and I mean God this guy he had the nine lives of a cat man he just blasted the hell out of me so I made it back to my first aircraft and literally the two aircraft when I crashed it and this was a good crash when we finally got out of the plane we were 
uh, less than 500 feet from the first aircraft that I had down. So I get in the plane, my wingman comes in, gets us, and we go back, and I said, get another airplane. When I land, uh, Colonel Cartwright standing there, and he said, come here, you to the club. And I said, wait a minute, sir, I know where they are. And he said, they know where you are, to the club. <laughs> I can't afford you. You've already cost me three aircraft this morning. And so uh, two days later, I, my paperwork was in. I got transferred to flying Cobras. Hmm. This is the this is the why I never went even thought going back in the Marine Corps. I'll go to fly Cobras and I go. Our unit had our unit had three platoons and we had to keep one platoon for a craft assigned as a special um, uh, SOG which everybody thinks is Special Operations Group. That's not what it was. It was Studies and Observation Group. The reason that was to keep the press from understanding what we were doing. They thought we were, you know, a bunch of green berets, you know, with calculators or with slide rules. It's funny as hell. But anyway, we were we signed 26 pieces of paper, saying that uh, we couldn't talk about what we did, nothing, for 25 years. And and the unit, in, until Ronald Reagan, he opened it up. Until then, you couldn't tell anybody who were SOG and what we did. So SOG basically is real simple. Um, studies and Observation Group was part of Op Plan 35, which was the CIA operated with the Joint Chiefs of Staff mission where we did long-range re um, long range reconnaissance, some pilot recovery, some the Air Force didn't like it, and I'll talk about that later, some um, uh, shady um, psychological warfare items, but primary uh, POW snatches where we try to get their POW, uh, get high-ranking members of uh, the North Vietnamese forces so we can interrogate them. Anyway, this was um, to take place in not South Vietnam, in Cambodia, Laos, North Vietnam, parts of Burma, and the five southern provinces of China. Indian country. <laughs> now, and be honest, helicopters couldn't reach China. Otherwise, we'd have been there, but we couldn't reach it. The SOG was bro uh, broken down to different layers. As far as our, our concern was, there was... CCS, CCC, and CCN. CCS is Command and Control South, which is basically all operations in Cambodia. CCC was basically Northern Cambodia, Southern Laos. CCN was Middle of Laos, North Vietnam. So our job was to basically insert recon teams. Recon teams were usually, usually two or possibly three <coughs> Americans and three to five um, mercenaries. And these guys were, um, they could be Chinese nuns, they could be... Um, uh, the Montyard people, which were the greatest. Yeah, I mean, I can't say enough about those guys. Just wonderful people. Um, and loyal to us to a fault. I mean, to a fault. They cost them their lives. So our package included four Cobras from our unit, four 
transport helicopters, usually from the 101st Airborne. Slicks, Hueys. Uh, usually one fact, or maybe two Air Force facts, Covey. Now, if a recon team got in trouble and they called what's called a prairie fire, that's the worst thing. They're surrounded or whatever. Prairie fire, once they called prairie fire, that went up on guard. Every aircraft, fixed wing bomber, every was t to stop their mission and go to them. So it, literally, when they got in trouble, they can literally instantly get 20 or 30 fast movers on top of them. The problem is they're dropping bombs that versus us. We're shooting rockets. We can we get down and dirty with them. Literally down. I, I literally I can throw a pair of rockets in between uh, tw twenty five feet. Whereas a bomber, he's trying to hit the top of the hill. So I'm not against the Air Force. The Air Force did a great job, especially when you get things like Spectre gunships and like those are at night uh, where they can just circle around and just hose the area. Or they, in the early days, it was Puff the Magic Dragon. But we fired rockets, and we were good at what we did. We were damn good. Um so we kept four aircraft. One, we had three platoons. So the rotation went is one platoon would go up to um, CCN. One platoon would be on reg regular missions for that day. And one platoon would be on stand standby. So that's four aircraft. But each platoon had six aircraft. So the two aircraft that were not being used were being serviced. <clears throat> so if you have, but not everybody volunteered for CCN because you had to sign papers. And we had guys that said, I don't want to fly. I have a very good friend of mine who lives here in the state of Washington who was a Griffin who did fly CCN. But if you asked him, he would rather not. He didn't want to fly CCN, but he did fly it. But we had pilots that said, I don't want CCN. I'm not signing any papers. I'm not going to do that. Here's what happens. If you get shot down, they don't get your body out. <clears throat> they notify your family you were lost at sea. Body not recovered. Because we weren't there. My flight time my flight records for CCN flights, which for me, I flew 100, 100, 140 hours a month, and probably two-thirds of that was CCN. And that's all blacked out, just redacted, redacted, redacted. That's, hey, that's it. That's the name of the game. You signed paper. And the guys that flew it constantly, Rick Freeman, myself, um, Chemitsky, um, Mock, uh, Gary Gluth, um, Krusty Garrison, who lives here, uh, up here in Kettle Falls. Uh, we, um, we flew our ass on. We loved it. Because when you took off, you knew you were going to shoot. You knew you were going to, we knew we were going to shoot. Plus, it was free fire area. We weren't in Vietnam. We didn't need clearances to shoot. Just if you saw somebody running around in a field down there, we knew where the recon teams were. He wasn't one of us to take him out. No harm, no foul. It was, for a gun pilot, it was the best. I didn't have to get clearances or anything. Plus. The camaraderie you built with the recon teams was huge. You save a team. When they come back and they get out of their aircraft, they run up to the Cobras and you're, you've got the windows open and you're 
cooling down the engine, and they come up. I had a guy come up and kiss me, said, I owe you, because he was in deep shit. That's exactly it. And the Cobras, and I once, <laughs> this guy just died, and this this is the legend. And for anybody interested in the history, they ought to read about this guy. They Everybody talks about great Americans. There's a guy that just passed away here last year named uh, Billy Waugh, Sergeant Major Billy Waugh, W-A-U-G-H. You ever hear of him? Billy Waugh, I gave him his ninth Purple Heart. I shot him in the ass. He was on a recon mission as a strap hanger. That means extra, extra guy. They were in to pick up a, uh, they were in there trying to snatch a um, POW on an engineering unit. They were building a road or something. And so Billy just in there. He, Billy went in to get collect souvenirs. That's the truth. So he's out there collecting all this crap. Anyway, the NBA got, once they get on the ground, they've only got, they're only going to stay there. There's not a recon team to stay there for a couple of days, you know. This guy's to get in there, snag, the, snag a prisoner, get one intel, and be out. So they're, they're going to be on the ground less than an hour. That's it. Maybe an hour and a half, but really less than an hour, the key. So Billy's out there grabbing, and all of a sudden the NBA get their stuff together, and they start charging. And I'm rolling in, and I see all these NBA, and you can, you know who they are. You see them running up the hill chasing this one guy. And all our guys had an orange panel on their top on their hats. They didn't wear helmets on their hats so we can see who they were. And, and so I just went in, rolled in, and shot a bunch of 17-pound uh, uh, head rockets in between and then tried to ease them into this onrushing group. Well, apparently some of the shrapnel ended up in the backside of Billy. So when the aircraft of Jolly Green come in, pick it up, and we get a team okay. We need a team okay. Get a head count, make sure everybody is counting for it. Got a team okay. And then they tell you we got uh, one WIA. So, you know, everybody, WIA. <clears throat> and they don't come out on the air and say Billy, but they say the strap hanger. Well, we know it's Billy. So we get back to Kwong Tree. They dump him off. He's had 18 surge. He's laying on a concrete thing in a triage. And he's, you know, they've cut all his stuff off his neck, and then they got this orange stuff they put on there, and they're starting to pick out shrapnel. <laughs> I had landed refuel and we came back over in a Jeep with a couple other guys to see him. And I walk in, I said, Damn, Billy, what happened? And he looked up at me. He said, When I get up here, I'm going to kill you. And I said, What? He says, you shot me. I said, I didn't shoot you. And he said, yeah, you did. And I said, no, I didn't. He said, when you flew over me, my air, my crew chief used to put under my aircraft, sneaky, in white letters, sneaky white was my call sign. And he said, when you flew over me, he said, I, after you shot me, you flew over me and I could see it's your aircraft. And if I could have, I would have shot you. Yeah, I love Billy. Billy was a surrogate father to me in the service. He taught my wife will tell you right now, a lot of times I'll tell I'll say something. I'll say, Billy taught me this. Yeah, Billy taught me. He's just an unbelievable guy. Yeah, see, what was the Silver Star action? Oh that well I uh that was um I, <clears throat> how do you know about the Silver Star? I saw your Silver Star in the thing, in the oh, case. Of, uh, oh, yeah. Well, <clears throat> I, um, <clears throat> we, um, I was flying a loach and, uh, we, um, I, um, recon, I was working, a recon team was in trouble and we were working the Cobras and I was flying a loach. And, um, after, um, the um, Cobras ran out of they ran out of ammo and they they were making dry passes, and the um, the uh, recon team had two um, critical guys critically, and so um, 
what I did was I said, you know what, screw it. Let's go, you know, sh let's shoot all your ammo in the plane. The, the, um, my door going to just shoot the shit up, just rack it. We're going in because, uh, and then just throw the, literally throw these two kids in the plane. Anyway, we took, um, I don't know, a dozen hits coming out and, um, and, uh, you know, invariably, the Loach is a great aircraft that can take a lot of hits. And if you crash it, you roll in the ball and theoretically walk out. Anyway, um, you know, when you, anytime you take hits and it blows out the, the window, you figure that I can, I can touch the front screen right there. So when you're taking hits that close, anyway, the, CNC, who couldn't get in, it was a very tight spot. They were going to have to actually, if they could get a metal vacuum in there, they were going to have to take them out on a um, uh, hoist. And now, figure that's five, seven minutes, and there's two. He would have never, guy would have never made it. I mean, the, um, the gunfire was that ra radical, so um, you know I went in there and, and it's, you know seeing he told me what are you doing, and I said I'm going to get him, and he said no, you know wave off, wave off, and uh, you know don't tell me to wave off, you know I, um, yeah, so I went in and got him, and um, uh, so I got him, got him out, big deal. And a cup of coffee. I don't drink coffee. I'm a tea drinker. Oh, anyway. So I flew with them for um, about fifteen months, and then when I had um, an operation called Lom Sum Seven Nineteen took place, and this was the last big, big operation in Vietnam. And what it was basically was. Uh, we, we, when I say we, the armed forces were going to go in, all the way through and cut into um, Laos along the Ho Chi Minh Road. They were going to cut it. And it was a great idea. The problem was twofold. Congress had prevent, would not allow, had prevented Americans from going into Laos, we weren't supposed to be there. So we could not have Americans on the ground with the Arvins. But we supplied the air power. So we had, I'll never forget this, we had a thousand helicopters, picture that, going that way, going west at one time. Okay, and, and if you ever read, there's some a book by uh, Keith Nolan, who he's passed on, but he and he wasn't a vet, but he was he would, did his homework and uh, about um, Lam Sam Seven Nineteen. There's several good books about it. The Lam Sam, it was a disaster, and the reason is the fair, the Arvin dropped the ball. Not all the Arvin units, but a lot of them turned tail. Plus, the NVA knew we were coming, or they knew they were coming. They were ready for them. Anyway, um, when Lam Sam 719 happened, they shut off SOG, said no more. So the first day of Lam Sam 719, a CAV unit um, lost, I think. Uh, they lost. I forgot. Um, Major Newman came down and saw me the night, the next day, and said, "Hey, sneaky, uh, you want to fly scouts again for me?" He said I lost three of them yesterday, and I I need somebody. So I said, "Sure, under the condition that when I'm done with you, this operation, I come back flying Cobras because I'll go back Special Forces." And he said, "Sure." Well, little did I know that was the end of Special Forces, totally because it was the end of the war. Anyway, so I go and I fly scouts, loaches from back in the flying loaches, and, uh, and this time in the Laos, which is really wild. Um, the NVA were all over the place shooting. I mean, it was just unreal. 
But um, it was, I know, it was exciting. <laughs> I don't want to say it was enjoyable, but it, it, yeah, it was exciting. I mean, we got back. But we lost a lot of guys. Long some 17, 19 was tough. After that, I stayed around flying um, for a cab unit for um, about five, six months, and then I came back to the States at the end of the war. So, Well, can I get just one more? Uh, if you had to kind of summarize briefly what your Vietnam experience means to you, is there any way you can do that in a brief little... It's the best. Vietnam experience was the best and the worst times of my life. Um I made friends that are my friends today. I don't have too many civilian friends. I'm trying to think, I probably don't have any. I'm a loner, but not when I'm around my friends. My best, one of my best friends is a guy named Sweet Griffin, Rick Freeman. Rick and I can sit in a room and not say a hundred words and have the greatest discussion in the world for three hours. <laughs> That's just the way it is. Um, it was a defining moment in my life where I feel I accomplished something good. We may have lost the war. We didn't lose the war. The politicians lost the war. Vietnam, the lesson learned was politicians need to stay out of the war business. And more importantly, and this is what I'm proud of being a Vietnam veteran, is that we are not allowing our country, i.e. politicians, but our country now to mistreat the veterans that have served in subsequent battles. If anything, we have become a strong voice for that. 